In this episode of the Business of E-Commerce, I talk with Sally Bunkham about launching a luxury gift business to moms. This is the Business of E-Commerce, episode 34. Welcome to the Business of E-Commerce, the show that helps e-commerce retailers start, launch, and grow the e-commerce business. I'm your host, Charles Pulaski. I'm here today with Sally Buckham. Sally is the founder of Mums Back, a company that provides luxury gift hampers for moms. I've asked Sally on the show today to, provide, to talk a bit about her journey into e-commerce. So hey, Sally, how are you doing? I'm good. How, how are you, Charles? Doing good. How, how did I do with the uh, pronunciation of your name? You, you were very good. It was all good. It, yeah, it's quite a British name, I think. Sally Buncombe. Um, but yeah, you got it. It's all good. All right. I tried to do that with my Boston accent. It's a little tough, but <laughs> hey, thank you. So yeah, I wanted to kind of talk to you about, you launched a site a while back um, and you sell, what is it? Luxury gift hampers? Could you explain? Yeah, that's it. So it's luxury gift hampers aimed at mums, uh, predominantly new mums. And um, we kind of focus on the stuff that you are denied when you're pregnant. Um, so things like cheese and uh, pate and quite a lot of alcohol, <laughs> which we call booze here in the UK, quite boozy. Um, <laughs> so uh, things like gin and Prosecco, Rioja um, and things like that. But we also sell stuff that's not food or drink. So we um, have things like teething jewellery, um, some books. Um, and we also have other items that you are allowed while you're pregnant, but they're just nice. So things like organic chocolate, uh, things like boost balls, which are all um, natural uh, protein balls that are just nice and easy to eat. Basically, just stuff that new mums would like. Um, yeah, that's that's basically what it is. Okay, so it's funny, the word uh, hampers, we call it a, a gift basket here in the US. So. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, gift here we say hampers or gift boxes, um, yeah, but all, all the same thing. Okay, got it. So gift baskets kind of directed, geared towards new moms. So it was something usually someone would buy for someone else sort of thing. Um, yeah, obviously it's a gift. Exactly. So, okay. So how did you kind of get into this? How did this kind of come about? And how long have you been uh, doing it for? So I've been doing it. We launched in March last year. So I guess that's just over a year. Um, I got into it um, really through motherhood, I suppose. So bef before um, I had my kids, I was working in a university down in the south coast of England, where I live now in Brighton. So um, I was working in events at a university and putting on workshops and stuff for students to get them interested in business. Um, and I, I was doing that for quite a number of years, nearly 10 years. Um, so I guess my time doing that, all the kind of the stuff I learned, meeting kind of entrepreneurs and business people kind of rubbed up on me, I suppose. Um, and then I, but I wasn't really planning on doing anything with it. I just kind of got inspired by it. Um, and then my husband and I had our first baby. So we had a, um, a little girl called Daisy in, um, in July 2014. And then um, that was lovely. Um, but then we had a bit of a shock because she was only three months old and we found out we were going to have another baby. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that was a bit of a shock. Um, and during, during the first pregnancy, we, me and my friends um, in the UK, we have something called NCT, National Childbirth Trust. And it's kind of like a sort of preparing for parenthood um, club, I suppose. You kind of um, join it and with other parents, you meet other parents that are in your local area and you kind of, uh, that are due to have babies at the same time as you. And it's kind of, you learn about how, you know, what you're going to, uh, parenting, I suppose. And it's a chance to meet other people going through the same thing. So I met these friends, um, other couples having a baby. And we used to meet up and chat and joke a lot about how, we missed a lot of the stuff we weren't allowed, you know, like the cheese and the wine and the pate and stuff. Um, and we joked about how the first thing we're going to do when we have this baby is go and have a glass of wine or some brie or something like that. And it was kind of like a bit of a running joke. Um, and then my husband, when we, ha when I had the first baby Daisy, he did actually get me some pate and some red wine. It was like, Oh, that's such a nice present because all the other gifts I were getting, they were lovely, but they were very, um, baby focused. And they were very kind of mumsy focused. So it was kind of like, oh, you're a mum now. Here's all these kind of, you know, bubble bar type things. And it was like, oh, but I'm still me. 
Um, so that kind of gave me a bit of the idea, I suppose. And then when I got pregnant so quickly, that kind of threw me into another nine month period of abstinence. And it kind of really solidified the fact that, no, I really do miss all this stuff. And now I can't have it again for another nine months. So it kind of solidified the concept, I suppose. Um, and also because I was at that point, it was like, oh, God, I can't go back to work now. I'm going to have two babies pretty much under one. Um, and me and my husband had always kind of had this dream of having our own business. He, for a living, he makes websites. Um, so it kind of made sense to do something online because I had all of that resource. Um, and, but we just didn't have the idea until that point. And we thought, hang on, we could. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything that exists about, you know, with uh, these new mum gifts that are aimed purely for the mum to kind of recognise her journey um, and there certainly isn't anything um, that focuses on the stuff you're denied while you're pregnant so that's kind of where the idea came from um, and we were going to do it quite sooner than we did do it but the sort of sad part but also the good part in a way in the end is that after I, ha I had the second baby I was hit with quite a bad period of postnatal depression um, which was obviously not very nice at the time um, but after I got better from that um, and also it didn't get diagnosed for ages because it was um, late onset I didn't realize I had it it didn't take the form that I thought postnatal depression took so I wasn't sad it wasn't that I didn't bond with the baby it was much later on and it was because she was poor she had this undiagnosed medical condition which meant she cried a lot of the time it's very stressful and that's what brought the postnatal depression on for me um but I wasn't really focusing on my mental health I was focusing on the kids it just took ages to diagnose and long story short after I got better I thought hang on how many other people are going through this and don't realize that they're poorly and don't get help I really would like to do some sort of awareness raising around that um and because the idea is all about recognizing the mum's journey um, it kind of made sense to have an element of that included in the sort of brand and the vision. So now with Mum's Back, um, every hamper or um, gift box or whatever you want to call it, um, every one we sell, a pound from every sale goes to a charity in the UK called the Pandas Foundation. They're a perinatal mental health charity. Um, and alongside that, I also raise awareness about perinatal mental health issues via um interviews and um, TV appearances and articles and blogs and that kind of thing so that's kind of become quite a big part of the mum's back brand that kind of social enterprise um, side of it which has actually turned out to be great uh, so it's weird that something so bleak has turned into something so positive um, yeah that's but great yeah, you, could, you could actually do that and kind of gear it towards charity like that yeah yeah it's really good and actually um so when I decided to do that part of the business it was just a kind of that will be a nice thing to do kind of thing I didn't really have any other plans for it other than to raise a bit of money and to just try and help other people that might have gone through a similar thing but actually it's turned into a really big thing and it's actually turned into quite a big hook for PR uh, for you know getting into newspapers and the paper uh, and the TV and stuff like that so it's actually become a really good way to get my brand out there which was not purposeful but it's just become you know a great thing all around that's one of those things you hear folks they you know it goes one of two ways right you either kind of go the charitable route because you're charitable and that kind of gives you a hook for pr or some folks use it as a pr lever and it's like this like you know almost charity thing so it's nice to hear obviously you know starting off that way and it helps pr and not doing yeah. it for pr um yeah, exactly. And I think because it's kind of an authentic story, because it's real and it's me, it's kind of worked and people quite like that human story yep. element of it. Um, so, yeah, it's worked, it's worked well. It was never my aim for it to be like that. But, uh, but yeah, it's all good. Yeah, I think when it's a true story and it really it fits, right? Because, you know, new moms, that, that's a real problem. Um, and it's something people can, a lot of folks, either they've had it happen or they know someone that it happened to. Um, yeah. So a lot of folks can relate to it. Yeah, definitely. So then, okay, so 2014 um, was your first daughter. And then so in two, later in 2014, um, your second child. So then you launched the business in 2016? Um, it was last year. So Ruby was born in July. So Daisy was born in July 2014. Ruby was born in July 2015. Um, and then the and then uh went through all of that business and then um the business was launched last year so march 2017 mum's back was 
born. All right. Like, so, so, ended. <laughs> March 2017. So what kind of yeah. first steps? What did you, you know, to actually, did you go out and try to source these products or what were kind of your first steps of actually getting the business launched and how did you kind of go about that? Yeah. So the first step, I guess, was that the plan was to just kind of do one launch hamper, one, one gift box and just kind of test the market and see how it's sold. So um, my plan was to just have this one offering um, and which contained all the elements of what my perfect new mum gift would be. So, uh, so that was red wine, cheese, crackers, chutney, and um, did I say cheese? There's five things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cheese, wine, crackers. Lots of, lots of cheese. Yeah. Yeah me and pate that's it yeah so those five elements of that um so that's basically my first steps were to source those uh, products um and get a kind of vision together of the brand um my friend is a graphic designer so I, she kind of helped me with the logo um and to get the site live which um with with that kind of imagery so that was in a way quite easy because of my husband um yeah, so that was that, that was the first step. Also, I was I was having to think quite hard about shelf life of products um, because with food and drink, obviously, that's something that's really important. So, my aim was to get products that were really high end but um, had quite a decent shelf life. So we went for like a jarred pate, for example, not a fresh pate because the jarred pate lasts for ages, whereas a fresh pate would have only lasted like two days, especially in the post. Um, yeah so so it was it was stuff like that and the cheese it was a hard cheese that was still unpasteurized so you're not allowed when you're pregnant but it's a hard cheese so it's got a good you can it travels well in the post um so it's thinking about things like that and thinking about packaging and courier um i guess they were the first steps okay and but and you started with one configuration basically one like option one set of, one skew essentially um, yeah so very that's simple. right very simple and my plan was to kind of go with that kind of lean startup approach of just kind of seeing how it went as you know doing one step at a time and not doing a massive business plan or anything like that but kind of just approaching it in baby steps to kind of keep adjusting as as I went um and that did seem to work but it was um I had to change quite quickly because um I decided quite early on to pitch um to a company don't know if you'd have heard it over there but um it's a company called not on the high um which in the uk is a massive um uh, a massive uh, site where people go to buy unique gifts that um aren't on the high street so unique um often personalized well thought out gifts for people so it's quite a big um quite a big website i guess it's or a like big... uh, etsy it's like the Etsy yeah. UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of okay. like Etsy. Kind of like Etsy, but maybe a bit less, um, well, I had to put it, a bit more um, slightly higher end maybe um, and perhaps more sort of personalized stuff, more food and drink gifts as well. I know with Etsy, I can't sell on Etsy because my products have alcohol in them. Uh, Etsy don't allow that, um, which is fine. Um yeah. Is, so, is that where you got your first sales from? So when you launched, you went not on the high street or where were those first kind of initial sales from? The, in the, the first initial sales were via my own website. Um, so that was just marketing via social media and stuff like that. And probably to friends and family were my first sales. Okay, so and kind of your, that, your so personal through. network. Yeah, and also I'd got, um, because of what I've been through with the two kids, um, I was on Facebook a lot because you find you find yourself in parenting uh, Facebook groups at like three in the morning looking for other mums and dads that are still out going ah, help me this is terrible I'm not getting any sleep so I was actually already um already in quite a lot of big sort of parenting Facebook groups which then were quite a good place to talk about the business and also to get sales from um so that was probably my first sales were via my own social networks and Facebook groups and stuff like that um, but it was quite early on that I decided, I just thought, what the hell, I'll, pi I'll pitch the idea to Not on the High Street. Um, it's quite renowned for being quite hard to get into to there. Um, and it's also becoming quite a saturated market for certain products like jewellery and stuff like that. But there's lots of um, 
people say oh it's really hard to get onto not on the high street so I didn't hold much hope for getting on there um, but I thought I'll just pitch to them because if I don't get on there I'll probably get some quite good feedback anyway and that will help me because they know what they're talking about because they're like you know one of the leading people for online um, gift sales you know in the UK uh, so I pitched to them quite early on I think the business was only about a month old I pitched the idea and I think I pitched to them on the Sunday night and then it was like half past nine on the Monday morning I got a call from them saying we love it this is a really new concept we really want you to be a partner with us um will you will you come on board with us um so obviously I was like oh my god they actually like me this is amazing um of course but they said there's one caveat to that we 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 really need you to have more offerings of products so you can't just have you can't come on board with us with only the one gift box you need to have more offerings so that was like oh okay that's not, but my plan is to just test the market and see how it goes and now suddenly I've got to get all these different uh, products and different offerings but I thought it you know it's an opportunity I can't miss so um, very quickly I had to sort of source more products and get more ideas and get more options available which is what I did um, so then I then I had all these other options so then we focused we had like a mother's ruin hamper which focused on gin and one that focuses on the tired man with the chocolate with coffee beans and the boost balls um, and one that focused more on Prosecco and then we got the teething jewelry and a couple of other then we had so then we got about another five options um, and started selling that so that kind of um, changed my strategy quite quickly by joining them. How are you, how are you, at this point, how are you fulfilling these? Are you going to suppliers and getting these different products? And then are you putting together baskets locally and shipping them from your office or house? Like how are you, at, how are you putting all this together and sending it back out at this point? Um, so at this point, um, it was, the stock was kept in my friend's cafe. Um, and that was because, because I sell alcohol, I have to have an alcohol premises license. So there's a bit of bureaucracy involved in what I sell because of the alcohol element. Um, so because she had a premises license and she was my friend, she said, yeah, of course you can store it here, that's fine. And you can fulfill the orders from here too. So um, that's what I did. So that I was at this point, I wasn't living in Brighton. I was living in a different part of the country in a town called Stamford. Um, so all, all of the stock was kept in her cellar in the cafe. Um, and I was fulfilling the orders from there. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I sourced, I sourced the products. Um, that was that was um, a mixture of different ways. So I just did research online um, and found products that I liked and got them to send me testers, um, and just went from there. Basically, there was the cheese was a local one to where I was in Stamford that was renowned for being a really lovely cheese, um, and the other product. I kind of like the chocolate, for example, I'd seen the lady that um, created her brand talk at the University of Sussex when I was doing my work there. So I already knew about her and had a bit of a relationship with her. Um, the pate um, was, I just had to do a lot of research for that because that was quite a niche product, a jarred pate. So that was kind of like, in a way it was quite helpful because there was only a few to choose from. Um, and the wine and the alcohol were, I really wanted, I, I really wanted half bottles of wine and Prosecco because I didn't want to be seen to be encouraging like new mums to drink loads of alcohol. <laughs> so I thought actually the sizing, I don't want a normal bottle of wine. I want like a half bottle, um, which again, that cut down a lot of options because there were only a few companies that were doing that, but I managed to find quite quickly a really nice one. Um, so yeah, it was a mix. It's basically just research and te testing them and tasting them and making sure I love them and then doing striking a deal with that supplier. But they're all they're all kind of like small, quite independent suppliers, which I like, and that kind of fits with not on the high street because not on the high street like you to have small, independent, you know, artisan type suppliers because they don't want the whole point of it is that it's um, not on the high street. Yeah, and. I I like that concept how you're actually going out to individual suppliers and like picking like these very particular products and trying them and saying, okay, this is the cheese that I like. This is a wine and seeing how it all fits and then putting it together and making something that's your own. So you're taking, you know, five off the shelf items, but like the, the combination of all of them is your unique offering. And that's kind of the, the interesting part that that's just 
that's where you add something with that. Uh, absolutely. So they're all just gifts, I guess, that I would have loved to have got um, when I was a new mum. So yeah, it kind of makes sense from that point of view. So, and then so all these, so you're getting all these products that come in, they go to the cafe, you're getting orders that come in every day, and then you're going to the cafe and putting together a, a, a gift basket and then sending it out right from there and kind of yeah. label yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Them. That's right. I mean, it wasn't orders coming in every day. It takes so long to build up the sales. But um, but yeah, it was it was it, that was the way it worked. Yeah. So I get my orders in, I'd go to the cafe um, and, and I do them from there and then they go off to the customers. Yeah. Yep. It's, yeah, it's funny that first order that comes in, it's like a celebration. But then you realize, oh, you need to get this like like this needs to be like an all the time thing. It can't just be like the. Yeah. So that first one, though, you get the the big rush. Oh, yeah, you do. I still get a rush every time I get a sale. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then when you got not on the high street, you had how many different baskets in total? Like five? Um, I think six. Okay. Yeah, six or seven, yeah. And then are you still doing the whole thing, sourcing them, orders? So orders then come in directly to you, and then you're still doing the same thing, shipping them out from the cafe? Uh, yeah, so now orders come in either direct via my own site from the mumsback.com site, or via not on the high street and then it's the same thing i fulfill them all myself um so yeah it's mother's day and christmas are a bit crazy <laughs> um but yeah it's it's fine i basic I, I try and do a lot of them in the evenings um when the kids are in bed i do all my packing up um yeah do you still have the same is it five options or have you kind of expanded or um, I think there's, um there is i think there's seven now but I'm about to launch a new range, actually. Um, so uh, there'll still be seven main hampers, but I'm launching a new range of kind of add-on items. Um, because now what I've realized is um, that I still really want to target the new mum market. But I guess as I've gone through my own parenting journey, what I'm realizing is that mums deserve treats and gifts, not just when they're new mums, but <laughs> all the time. <laughs> So my new range is going to be targeting um, all mums, I suppose. So all mums that deserve, you know, recognition or a treat. And I've realized now that there's so many um, occasions where that, um, you know, needs to happen or should happen. <laughs> you know, times like when your kid first goes to school or when they, you know, that first nursery drop off that's really emotional or when you've got a teething baby or when they're ill um, you know, so sort of the parenting journey all the way through um, is, is going to be, you know, targeting those parents in that situation all the way through is now going to be my target, not just new mums. Although I still do focus on new mums because it's still kind of like focusing on the stuff you're not allowed while you're pregnant. Um, but I think mums enjoy that stuff all the time, not just when they're new mums. So, yeah, so I, I suppose I'm changing the scope slightly there and sort of broadening it a bit. I think it was great to start off so niche and that niche is still working for me, but I think it's time to sort of broaden it a little bit now. Well, then you're probably able to also hit hit up some repeat customers because you obviously have a list of mums, so then now, new mums, so now you know, you know, if they ordered a year ago, you can go fast forward um, another year from now and you realize, okay, that's the one year old birthday and here are kind of the milestones. So you can start kind of plotting out when they ordered the new mum gift at the different milestones for, you know, yeah. first day at school, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly that. So that's kind of the direction that we're heading in at the moment. So we've got a few new products um, that are lined up, ready to go. So we've got like a, a coffee, a, a cold compressed coffee. Have you heard of that? It's basically, it's like a um, concentrated coffee. It's quite new over here. Not many people have heard of it here either. Um, it's kind. Of, it's really cool. It, you can either. It's kind of like a squash. I don't know whether you call it squash there. Um, <laughs> you know where you like um, or a cordial where you where you pour um, concentrated orange or black currant or whatever and mix it with water to make a drink. Is this cold? Is this cold brew coffee we're talking about? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, 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 I literally, I have one right here. At, oh, how funny! Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this one is called Artemis and you can it's concentrated and you can either just add hot, hot water and it makes a nice coffee or you can use it to make like espresso martinis or you can use it in cooking to make a nice coffee flavored cake um so we're selling little bottles of that okay. um and we've got a really nicely designed eye mask to help sleep we've got some aromatherapy 
um, products, so um, a little aromatherapy stick that helps with headaches, um, one that helps sleep, um, that kind of thing. So we've got a few, uh, we've got some, some more stuff lined up. Yeah, expanding it to more new, you know, new and current mums at this yeah, point. Yeah, okay. exactly. Basically, mums that um, are probably a little bit tired or a little bit stressed and just need a treat. Yeah, I have a. Uh... Three year old and a six month old, so oh, I know what the uh, yeah. Oh, so I, you probably deserve a treat as well. <laughs> I, I would. That's why I'm drinking that coffee right now. So there you yeah. go. I feel you. Yeah. I hear you. <laughs> so then, fast forward to present day for marketing and that sort of thing. You yeah. Know, you've probably had to expand outside your network, outside of the mums group and that sort of thing. Um, what have you? What are you doing now to try try to find a more um, sustainable flow of new moms because obviously it's something that you know every month is new mothers coming in but you have to kind of figure out where that place is and you can kind of keep dipping into that pool De definitely yeah well there's a few uh i guess there's a few directions i'm going in for that um so one direction is i've noticed that a lot of the sales i because i write all the gift cards as well and I, so i kind of read the messages which is a real privilege actually makes me cry a lot um i get to read what people are saying and who um who the gifts are from and these are, these are handwritten each one yeah oh, wow. yeah so, yeah i do a handwritten gift card with with you know whoever's um bought its message hmm. What's, um, what is the price point i just had a curiosity sorry to um, so that, that's okay uh so they range between about 35 pounds and about 110 pounds yeah, um, that's about the price at the moment. Uh, but what I've realized is that um, a lot of the gifts are from people in companies buying the gifts for women that are just about to go on maternity leave. Um, so what I'm realizing is that it's a really nice maternity gift um, and a really nice way for companies to show, um, you know, appreciation for their for their female work. <laughs> when yeah. they go for the baby have you been able um, to find a marketing angle to that because i feel like there's something that you could tie into where you know that event's taking place somehow yeah yeah well i think it's a really because at the moment the gifts are very much one-off gifts so you know i get a customer they buy a, buy a hamper or a gift box and then that's it they need you know to buy another one they need to know another woman that's special to them in yep. exactly the same situation so what I, what I really need to find is a way to get more repeat business. Um, and the corporate gift market is definitely a way to do that. So, you know, there's companies that have hundreds and thousands of women going on maternity leave all the time. And if, if I could um, be the go-to gift for, the, you know, for, um, for that situation, then that's a great thing for me. Um, so, yeah, so one of, one of my angles is trying to get in, um, you know, with big companies, um, that you know that are going to buy the gift often, um, so that's one one thing that I'm looking at. And actually, I've got a I've got a team of um, university business students doing that as a project at the moment, which is really great. I did a I did a I did a kind of course here in the UK called Entrepreneurial Spark, um, and they have links with the with the community here, and they work with the University of Sussex, weirdly, which is where I used to work, but it's nothing really to do with that relationship they um they ask for proposals uh for um real life product projects for students uh to work on and i said look this is a target market i want to get into do you want to work on this and now they're sort of working on it for me which is great <laughs> um so we'll see how they get on um so yeah there's that and then generally i try i've, I've been quite lucky in a way i've been in the paper in the uk quite a lot and i've been on the television a fair amount as well and that's kind of via the uh, perinatal mental health awareness raising stuff um so i've sort of continued to do that has that been kind of the flow for the like for the one-offs for the just the folks coming in that happen to find you is it usually through press they kind of find you um no, there's there is that that so that that does happen but now i've got a kind of much more solid seo strategy so i'm blogging um, and I've got a little SEO strategy with very specific keywords and pages to link to. And that's definitely working now because a lot of my sales, when I get sales, I ask my customers to fill in a little tick box. Where did you hear about me? 
I'm getting a lot more now um, saying search engine. Um, so that's really great. And it shows that I think my SEO strategy is hopefully working for me there. Um, so that has been via blogging. I do quite a bit of guest blogging and I blog via my own site. Um, but also because I've been lucky enough to appear in a lot of the papers, they've I think they've got quite a good domain authority. So, um, I've, you know, there's stories about me in places like The Guardian and The Independent and The Metro, which are quite big papers, The Sun, uh, which are quite big papers here in the UK. So to get links and stories about me there, I think has done quite well for my SEO as well. What kind of stories? So, for example, for like The Guardian, what kind of stories are they doing that kind of... Uh, Wow, The Guardian was quite an interesting one, actually. I've, um, so I've, I've, uh, I've, got, I've got in that story was about people that were doing bad, that did badly in their A levels. I don't know. Do you know what A levels are? I'm They're not, like I'm not uh, sure. I'm, I have an idea, but I'm not exactly yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, so you in the UK when you're at school, when you're 16, you do GCSEs, and then if if you stay on in education, when you're 18, you do A levels. And then if you stay on again, you go to university. So when I was 18, I did my A-levels and I did really badly in them because I was like, you know, doing what 18 year olds do. I was drinking and looking at boys. <laughs> um, so I didn't do very well in my A-levels. Um, but I still managed to get into a university in Brighton. And, and then like from there, it was, it was all OK. But it was around A-level results time here in the UK um, and there was a journalist was looking for stories about people that did badly in their A-levels but are doing well now. And I just said, well, I did really badly in my A-levels and now I'm doing this business. And she liked it as a story and sort of used me as a case study. How did, how did you make that connection with that journalist? Like, what's the actual, what was that yeah. like and how did you find them? Or how did they find you? Um, so I was doing this kind of um, work. In the UK, there's this lady called Janet Murray who's a bit of a PR guru. And I was listening to podcasts that she's done and she was talking about how you can get in the paper. Um, and um, basically there's these kind of um, media, um, how would you describe it? There's these agencies, I suppose, that kind of link journalists with case studies and stories. Um, and you have to pay to have this service, um, but you can also do a free trial so I, it's a company called Response Source, and um, basically you can pay to um, have journalists send you um, story requests that they're after in certain areas. Um, but I was just doing the free trial because I thought, well, I'll, I'll have a, I'll, I'll, I'll do the free trial and see what it's like, and then maybe I will um, pay to be on there permanently turns out it was really expensive and I, I didn't do it in the end but on the free trial I got lucky because there was this there was this journalist from the Guardian who said she was looking for these stories about A-levels and I just pitched her um, and she liked it and that was really lucky because at the end of the free trial they were like hang on a minute you've just got in the Guardian doing this free trial are you going to join us and I was like you said no yeah, nah, sorry I'm not <laughs> they were like what no one gets <laughs> that's interesting so, yeah, I, just lucky. <laughs> I know the concept of a lot of people. I don't know if it's the uh, same thing in the UK, but Haro, how about a reporter? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I idea. get, well, yeah, it's that kind of thing, but um, it's a bit more, it's paid for. So the stories tend to be more um, in the big papers, uh, you know, like the, you know, the, more, the sort of more red papers. Because the way Haro works, it's a, it could be anywhere from someone writing from, you know, The Guardian or the, you know, yeah. New York Times, but it could also be like an ebook. It's everything. It's yeah, the whole everything. Yep. And it takes quite a long time to sift through it all, doesn't it? To see. Yeah. Um, yes. see if, yeah. So that's kind of like, whereas with response source, um, it's very targeted. So you say, yeah, I'll pay to have just women's stories um, or stories in health or, you know, very specific. So you get the emails, but they're like m m likely to be in really big papers on exactly your area. And uh, probably much fewer um, requests at that point. So it's not something higher you go through and there's pages and pages um, versus this is just targeted mm. to you. It's stuff you know you're going to yeah, you're exactly. going to be somewhat interested in. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, Although I, do, I have got quite a lot of stories in papers just via Twitter. So on Twitter, um, just by doing hashtag journal requests. 
Um, so often journalists are looking for stories on certain areas. It's journal, um, journalist request? Hashtag journalist yeah, request. Um, hashtag journo request. So J-O-U-R-N-O request journo. Yeah. I don't know. Um, it might, it's probably just a UK thing, actually, because this, um, I don't think I've seen many um, American requests. I don't know if there's one in the US for that similar thing. But um, in the UK, yeah, you do hashtag journal requests and you do, it's similar to Haro. You have to sort of um, sift through a lot of rubbish and bloggers wanting, you know, freebies and whatever. Um, but there will be some gold in all of that. And I've got in the Metro, I've got in the Sun um, uh, and quite, you know, some quite big papers just from doing that. Um, so that's another way um, to yeah, get it sounds like, like your story out there. And it sounds like this has kind of helped out the, SEO and it's kind of gone back and forth where yeah, exactly. you know, getting, a, getting a link from, you know, the guardian, obviously that bumps up your SEO and then you're able to generate some articles and actually have them found at that point and then go back and get some more articles and they kind of tick tock off one another. Exactly. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's been a kind of a mishmash of different ways to get, to get out there. A journal request was the way I got onto the television. So I was on a BBC show called Victoria Derbyshire which is quite a big like primetime show, uh, just being interviewed about perinatal mental health. Um, and and then that story made it onto BBC News that day. Um, so that was great um, because BBC's like, if you can get a link on BBC, that's really, really good domain authority. I can, it can definitely uh, match on the BBC as uh, can, yeah. can move the needle. Now, can move the needle. Now, do you see an immediate jump those days? So if you're featured on... BBC News. Do you see kind of that a pop, or is it later? Or how does that work? It, you see a massive. You see in the analytics, you see a massive um, influx of people looking on the site. Doesn't necessarily mean you'll get a massive influx of sales. Not at all. I think it's a much more gradual build up um, than that. So people assume. I think people assume because I'm doing quite well with publicity that um, my sales must be massive. And that's. I mean, I'm doing okay, but that's not. It's not the case. Like I was in the Sun, which is. Um, it doesn't have a great reputation in the UK, but it's probably the most read paper in the UK still. Um, and I was in there and I, I didn't, I saw a massive influx of people looking at the site, but I didn't see a massive influx the following day or even that week of sales. But I think it was still great because um, it got, you know, it got my name out there and people then knew about, about me when, you know, for a time that I was needed you know when they did know a mum that just had a baby or their wife had just had a baby or they were asking for gifts for them or whatever so um yeah I don't think it's a sudden it's not a, it's not the silver bullet it's a gradual build-up thing and I think that's what people need to yeah that's a big takeaway right there where like you think a lot of people they're looking for like this one you know they'll get featured on the BBC and that'll be the thing um or TechCrunch or whatever it is and that will be like the pop and it'll change everything and then it'll all be up and to the right for <laughs> forever exactly and it's that's not the case and I, I think it's very rare that that is the case um and I speak to a lot of people that have been featured in places like that and they will say the same thing I mean if you can get featured in like uh, there are some occasions where it really does work like if you can get featured in the Guardian's Christmas gift guide for example brilliant with one product that's great with not on the high street if you can get into a, what it's called a curated category or into their gift uh, catalog for mother's day for example which i i did last mother's day then i did get a massive influx of sales because for those types of things people are looking they're looking at gift guides because they want to buy a gift they're looking to buy they are they are ready to buy versus if you just read you know watching the five o'clock news you're not thinking, you know, you might not know anyone that's pregnant at that moment. So, but if you're looking at mother's gifts, you are primed and ready. Exactly. Yeah. You're very warm and that's what you're up for at that yeah. time. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's my feelings on that. If you can get into a gift guide that's really high level, then fantastic. If it's just a general sort of human interest story and stuff like that, great for domain authority, great for, you know, a touch point of a potential customer knowing about you, but I don't think it's a quick you're not going to get loads of sales that following day or anything like that. Any other kind of surprises like that, that, you know, maybe three years ago you wouldn't have thought and now kind of been through it. You, you kind of see, oh, wow, this is <laughs> not as expected. Um, 
Well, I suppose all the PR and publicity stuff has been a bit like that. Um, it's been a real learning curve and it's been really enjoyable. Like, you know, when I first started the business, there's no way that I thought oh, I'm going to be on a primetime TV show or anything like that. Um, I really enjoy it, actually. I really like that side of, of, of the business. I really enjoy doing interviews and things like this. I really enjoy it. Um, and actually the telly stuff, it isn't that nerve wracking. I quite enjoy it because it's just like you and the person interviewing you and a couple of cameramen. Whereas I've also spoken at like quite large events and stuff like that, where there's like 300 people in the audience. And I find that really nerve wracking, <laughs> I think, because the people are right there in front of you and you can see their faces. Um, so that's I suppose that's been a surprise. I thought that um, I would have thought going on telly where there's like potentially millions of people watching you would have been really nerve wracking. But actually, I quite enjoyed that. And it's the sort of events where there's more than 10 people there were looking at you that's more nerve wracking. <laughs> um, but yeah, other than that, I suppose what I've learned is that it's not actually that hard to get in. It's not that hard to get yourself out there with the right story. And probably what I've learned most is that it's much easier to find journalists that are looking for stories on stuff than it is to pitch cold for something. That's, that's a tip right there, I think. Yeah, and it's what you've got to realise is that, um, oh, I've got a business is not a good story. Um, you need it to be like relevant. Like It's like what's, you know, it's not about you. It's about the reader. Um, and I suppose the journal requesting and um, finding journalists that are looking for stories on stuff is actually a great way to kind of mine your life and kind of uh, find stories that you didn't know were in there because, for example, I'd never have thought that that story about me doing badly in my A-levels would have been a good story until someone said, hey, we're looking for a story on the, on this. Yeah, it sounds like you're more, you're look, you're trying to find what the journalists want and then how you fit into what they want and not just, hey, I still get baskets, write a story about me, but more like, what are you writing about and how do I fit into that profile? Exactly. Absolutely. And I think that's a really good way to go about it. Yep. And that's... Yeah. And that's what gets a journalist actually, it's what they want. It's not, you know, just batting them over the head of, hey, I saw these, you know, this is what I do and write about me. Yeah. It's more about what are you writing about? Yeah, what's relevant, what's topical at that time. Um, yeah, and uh, I do that as well. So I set up Google Alerts. So every time there's something in the press or the media about perinatal mental health, for example, or postnatal depression, which there is quite often because sometimes celebrities will come out and, uh, and talk about how they've been through it or something like that. Then you can kind of ride off the back of that and pitch to a journalist um, because it's topical and relevant. So that's another top tip. If you, whatever area you're in, um, set up a Google alert for it. So for me, it's, it's kind of motherhood and parenting issues, perinatal mental health. And then whenever stories like that hit the press, you can kind of use that and um, pitch stories on it because you know it's topical and relevant and people are likely to be interested in it. I think that's that's very helpful actually. I think um, that's one insight right there that most people, you know, working with journalists, I think most people are trying to approach them, make it all about them and seeing the kind of reverse and making it about the journalist or what they're writing about and the reader and seeing how you fit into that is really like a, a huge yeah, takeaway. Yeah, it's just about making it easy for journalists because journalists, basically, at the end of the day, they're like you and I. They've got a job to do and they want to get it done well and they want to get it done efficiently and they want to get it done so they can go to the pub or go home to their kids, you know. So if you can make it easy for them um, and be really succinct. Uh, another thing I've learned is make sure that on every platform, like your website, your social media, it's so easy for them to contact you. Make sure your number's on there. Make sure um, your email address is on there so that they don't have to sift through loads of stuff to find that out. So on my website, I've got biography and I put um, I'm available to talk um, on these issues. Here's my number. Here's my email address. It's just so easy and accessible. And when you're pitching them, if you if you think you've got a good story, just make it really succinct and just put in the subject title story idea. So that they're really clear that you've got a story idea and and then it's kind of like the sort of pyramid of information so it's kind of like what the story is briefly and um and then how to contact you and just don't and also if you if you want to actually write an article for them don't spend ages writing it and then send it to them like check with them that it's something they want first 
because otherwise you're just wasting your time. So if they don't want it, then, you know, you've just wasted all that time. You could have just found out what they want and what angle they need um, because, you know, they might like the idea, but perhaps a slightly different angle or something like that. So you don't waste each other's time. So I found that press releases, I don't do any press release. I just do tailored emails to journalists to say, would you be interested in this topic on this story? So that it gives them the chance to reply and say, actually, yes, but maybe this angle. And then you can sort of have a back and forth. So awesome. that's my, yeah. <laughs> I think that's super helpful. That definitely, um, I think we'll, we'll end it right there because I think that's a perfect place. That was super helpful. I think some people are going to find a lot of insight in that. So thank you for that. I hope so. No, no problem. Thank you. It's been really fun. Yeah, thank you for coming on. If folks want to find you, if folks want to order a gift basket, um, do you, do you deliver to the US or is it just... I'm afraid not. Only... It's, just, it's mainland UK just because of the cheese. Yep. My, che my cheese doesn't travel that far, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Un unpast me. Unpasteurized cheese too is a, an odd thing yeah. over there. It, uh, you don't find it very often. We do have it, but not uh, not most of the time. But if you ever do, definitely. Um, but if people want to find you, where could they? Yeah, so... Basically, it's all just mums back. So M-U-M-S-B-A-C-K. So that is me on Twitter. That's me on Instagram. That's me on Facebook. Um, and it's mumsback.com. Yeah. Awesome. We will definitely link to that in the show notes. So thank you very much for coming on. Oh, no worries. I've really loved it. Thanks for having me.